Joni Sherm's planned retirement was turned upside down by letters that she found in her father's belongings, what the letters revealed and how they transformed her life. I tell this generation, you know, I know you think I'm from that other generation, but I can still hear, you know. <laughs> uh, and you can still groove. I can still groove. You'll definitely feel the groove when you start growing bolder. We're rebranding aging and inspiring you to live with a bolder beat. What's most important to you? What really matters? Remember when you thought the future was filled with limitless possibility? It still is. Dreams don't have an expiration date. It's not too late to find your purpose, to live with passion, to make an impact in the lives of others and in the world we live in. Stop growing older and start growing bolder. Support for Growing Bolder provided by Hi, I'm Mark Middleton and welcome to Growing Boulder. Life is about moving forward. It's important that we don't live in the past, but it's equally important that we don't forget about the past, especially where history is concerned. When Joni Sherm retired, she had no idea what was next, but when she uncovered a chest that was filled with her father's old letters, she became an investigator, an author, an historian, and ultimately a teacher. Yes, a lot of what I have spent time doing is being in classrooms or being in teacher institutes where they're training people to teach either the lessons of the Holocaust or human rights and the importance of protection of human rights. What really exists in those letters are the buildup to what happened in Germany in 1930. So you have to understand that history. And there are many echoes of today really around the world. So uh, it kind of haunts you a little bit when you see that, but it also gives me hope because what I see are a lot of very re-engaged people and then the new generation really coming forward and, and speaking up and becoming active. So I think a lot of that happened after World War II. You had the UN formed, you had the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights that had to work its way through 120 countries. I kind of see that that is where we have to go in order to really have a better world. So I think that will happen. The story of Joni's family is one of heartbreaking tragedy, but it's also one of incredible hope and inspiration. She tells the story in a new book in the voice of her father. And while it's his story on the pages, it's her story that makes it all happen. Joni Sherm hoped to travel when she retired 10 years ago, but had no idea it would become a journey of personal discovery. Along the way, she uncovered family secrets, revealed an international network of young people fleeing Nazi persecution, and became a respected scholar, teacher, and author. I had no idea. This is really an unexpected, uncommon journey um, that I have adored from the very beginning. It all began after her parents passed away within two days of one another. While going through her father's belongings, Joni discovered nearly 400 letters written in Czech. The first letter she had translated changed her life. It was written to her father by her grandfather just days before he and Joni's grandmother were taken to a Nazi extermination camp. It begins, My Dear Boy. April 21st, 1942, My Dear Boy. Today we are leaving for a gathering point to follow the fate of those unfortunate people in three to four days who since last October have been gradually chased out of their homes and sent to concentration camps, robbed of everything they had. I am not certain whether I will see you ever again, so I decided to write these lines as my goodbye to you. I just always try and imagine him sitting there, you know, and writing that letter to his son just amazing. And then, I had, and then I imagined my father receiving it. He didn't receive the letter for three years and knew at the time that he was reading his father's final wishes. 
and what his father wishes for him, that he will not use his profession of curing, his, he was a doctor, not just use his profession of curing um, to gather wealth, but that he use it to be a benefactor to the suffering humanity. And that was the, that was the way I met my grandfather, who I never got the opportunity to meet. Um, and it was, I instantly fell in love with this man when I read the letter. Inspired by a single letter written by a relative she had never met, Joni had all 400 letters translated and learned that they were from 78 different writers. When pieced together, they revealed a fascinating, heartbreaking, and ultimately inspiring story with her father as the central character. Oswald Holzer was a young doctor in the Czech Army when the Nazis arrived in 1939 and incorporated his unit. In a daring escape, he returned to Prague to see his parents and then made his way to China, one of the few countries accepting those of Jewish heritage. It was there that he met and married Joni's mother, the daughter of American missionaries. Within months, they were on the President Coolidge evacuation ship, carrying Americans from Asia as the Japanese became more aggressive in advance of Pearl Harbor. The letters are a first-hand account of young people fleeing the Nazi Holocaust. Joni dubbed them Adventurers Against Their Will in her award-winning first book. Translating the letters wasn't enough. Joni traveled to places mentioned in the letters, found and spoke to the few letter writers still alive, and interviewed descendants of those who were gone. In the end, it was a story she had to share. These are my inspiration. When I started writing, I, you know, it was all new to me. I always wanted to write, you know, wrote when I was little kind of thing, but, and I was overwhelmed with the collection, how much there was, and what I was going to do, and how I was going to write the story and everything. And a friend of mine said one day, knew about the pants and all, said, you should just go upstairs one day and you should just strip down and put on the pants and wear the pants. And that'll give you your inspiration. And I did that. The letters revealed that her father wore his old riding pants over his military uniform on the day that he made his life-saving escape. It was better to wear that because there were people uh, walking in riding pants at that time in history. So you could just kind of disappear into a crowd and people didn't notice. What do they represent? Uh, obviously his ingenuity, his determination. I mean, they really represent everything. I think mostly they represent the fact that my brother, sister and I exist. They're now part of an important historical collection and educational platform that Joni has built and shares with teachers and students in the U.S. and Europe. So you have to understand that history. And there are many echoes of today really around the world. So uh, it kind of haunts you a little bit when you see that. And it's really good for, for kids in school. I mean, you can learn about the Holocaust, but you can also learn about, you know, what happens when uh, autocrats go into control and what, what that looks like. And again, there's echoes of that around the world. Before discovering the letters, Joni had no real details about how her father's journey to America began but she certainly knew how it ended. He was married and in love with her mother for 60 years, raised a wonderful family, and granted his father's dying wish, becoming a pillar in his community and using his skills as a doctor, not just to make money, but to make a difference. Despair it brings darkness into people's lives, but hope really invigorates us and moves us on, and I think that's the way that my father lived his life. My Dear Boy, written in her father's voice, is as fascinating as it is important. A reminder of the dangers of human aggression and intolerance and the power of love and compassion. I still believe that, you know, one candle in a room can light it up and it provides hope. And so what I see are a lot of very re-engaged people and then the new generation really coming forward and, and speaking up and becoming active. Sharing her father's story has added an entirely new chapter to her story with the promise of more to come. You know, it's been great and I really do feel like it gave me a, a purpose I never would have been expecting to be given. I'm 70 and that was a number that, you know, sounded daunting a while back, but now I feel great. I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot to, to happen. I, I love seeing the world. I love traveling the world and I feel very fortunate. So I, I think women of my age, you know, really look at the world differently than our, than our moms did. And we're lucky for that. So what can we learn from Joni Sherm and her successful post-retirement reinvention? Here's a few things to consider. 
Cultivate curiosity. A lack of curiosity means acceptance of the status quo, which in an ageist culture is highly destructive. Curiosity is one of mankind's most important characteristics and leads to lifelong learning. Embrace the internet. A great place to indulge your curiosity is the internet. Sure, we now know that the internet is filled with misinformation and we need to check all sources, but it remains the greatest, most accessible lifelong learning tool in history. Be fearless. Joni Sherm didn't let the minor detail that she had never written a book keep her from writing one after she retired. We've interviewed countless men and women who wrote their first book, had their first art exhibit, got their first acting job, or competed in their first race in their 90s and even 100s. You're only too old if you think you are. Capturing and preserving family stories is also the mission of StoryCorps, an independent nonprofit project that features a traveling airstream turned into a mobile recording studio. StoryCorps started back in 2003, and since then, more than 150,000 people in every state have shared their stories. These interviews are now archived and accessible by anyone at the American Folklife Center at the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, if you're into the music of the 70s and the 80s, you've got to love the Commodores. Songs like Easy, Brick House, and Three Times a Lady took them right to the top. This story is about the man who created the Commodores, defined their sound, and will never give up on his quest to get the band back together. But his path has been filled with the sting of racial prejudice, runaway egos, and the trappings of excess. Through it all, he's discovered what he believes is the true definition of success. Tripping on the life that I'm living Life's too short to bother me Thomas McClary's life has been nothing short of amazing. The man who formed the Commodores, discovered Lionel Richie, wrote and co-wrote some of the band's greatest hits, feels like he's ready for his next adventure. And he's had plenty of them, going all the way back to 1965, when out of the blue he made a decision that in the fight for civil rights made him part of history. He became the first black student to attend the all-white high school in Eustis, Florida. That morning, I decided, you know, I'm going to do this. And uh, as I walked to school... Um, by yourself. By myself. <laughs> and uh, to have oranges and bricks thrown at me, and uh, one actually hit me in my back. How interesting, though. You didn't really see yourself as a civil rights leader. You saw a situation and said, well, why can't... I. That's right. Why can't we? Was it courage? Was it, were you naive? You know, what was it? It was, it was courage. It was boldness. It was determination. I was a student of Dr. King and Jack Robinson, and I knew that they had chosen the nonviolent route, and that was going to be my choice as well, and uh, I was determined that I was gonna love in spite of whatever happened to me, even when they burnt my sweater while I, I had it on, literally. It was a philosophy that would apply to many aspects of his life. For college, he went to Tuskegee University, where, while waiting to enroll, fate touched him once again. And as I was standing in the registration line, it was raining and it was, you know, I was like, man, did I make the right decision coming to Tuskegee, little small <laughs> college town? So I hear this gentleman whistling a song by Eddie Harris, you know, and Eddie Harris is a jazz musician. He plays saxophone. And this guy was whistling all the nuances in the solo and everything, you know, so I'm like, whoa. So I turned to him and I said, hey, are you a musician? He was very shy, you know, he like looked down and all this. This is not really. I said, well, I'm trying to find some band members because uh, I'm going to put a band together and we're going to be the Black Beatles. <laughs> he looked at me like I was crazy. This guy was Lionel Richie, you know. That was Lionel Richie. That was Lionel Richie. That's how we met. And the whole way that worked, Lionel, when he, when you guys put the first couple incarnations of the band together, he was a sax player. Yeah. 
That's exactly right. He wasn't a singer. No, he wasn't. Until one morning, you heard him in the shower. Yes. <laughs> Is that real? That's real, man. I, I'll, I heard this guy singing in the shower, and I go, hey, you can sing. <laughs> With their new lead singer and band members handpicked by McClary, everything clicked, and they decided to go for the big time and headed for New York. We just barely made it in because we didn't have enough money to get through the, through the toll booth. <laughs> it was that bad. It was that bad. It got worse when someone stole their gear. So now we're in New York, no equipment, no money. Empty-handed, they went to a Harlem hotspot called Small's Paradise, where they couldn't believe they ran into a guy trying to sell something. And we go, man, that's our equipment. And this, he had some of my uniforms, too, with the cleaners tag still on it. <laughs> what did he want for it, the equipment? 50 bucks. <laughs> you can only have 50 bucks. We don't bucks. have 50 bucks, Bill. We don't have 50 bucks. <laughs> what they did have was a little bit of luck when someone who saw the whole thing go down lent them the money and said, I know the management very well here. When that band takes a break, I'm going to have you guys Go in there, and if you're not the Black Beatles, <laughs> you're going to be in trouble. If you can't play for real. We came out with all this energy and singing and dancing and lit the place up. They went nuts. And the gentleman that loaned us the $50 wound up becoming our manager, Benny Ashburn. The Commodores were unstoppable, and in 1977, they cemented their place among the best with the hit single, Easy. Easy like and? It was you who recorded what most agree is the greatest guitar solo oh, man, that's in, in music. Well, you know, that was my first time uh, getting a write-up in Rolling Stone magazine. <laughs> and as a musician, you know, you're like, hmm, it's, it's not bad. <laughs> it's a classic uh, solo that will withstand the test of time. helped catapult Richie to stardom, and when he started making solo albums, well, it was the beginning of the end of the Commodores. McClary tried to hold the band together back then, and was still holding out hope when he was hit with the unthinkable. After 30 years of trying to bring them back together, I said, you know what, I'm just going to do, do some dates, and uh, maybe they'll come along. Next thing I knew, they hit me with a lawsuit saying, uh, you know, you can't do this. I guess that was the most devastating period of my whole adult life to have um, my brothers who I literally handpicked and literally brought into this group to say to me, you know what, we're going to put the law on you. <laughs> and ban you from even being a part of something that you created. Despite being hurt and confused, he once again chose love. You could be bitter guy, always looking back. Yeah, but that's, that's never been my nature. And uh, it got to be contentious there for a minute. And, uh, and I told the, the judge and the jury that I was not going to let the corporation separate me from the love that I have for those guys. McClary stood tall in the courtroom, and now he feels it's his time to stand tall again on stage. 
And it's, it's never too late to do it again? No, it's not. This is the best time of my life right now. Because, you know, when you have that sense of you just feel that you're right on the verge of just something huge, that's where I am right now. And it's that same feeling I felt just before Brick House and Easy and all that. It was like, and I was sharing it with my wife. She said, man, you were just bubbling around here. You just, I said, yeah, because I sense it. I feel it. It is, we are right there. If not with the Commodores, which he still has hopes for, then with a new band featuring his own kids. Hey, do what you want. Do what you want. Come on. It's only because of you I can do the things I want to do. Hey, say what you want. Say what you want. I'm so excited. I feel like I felt when I was birthing the Commodores. This is a new era for me and it's an opportunity to be innovative again and to be refreshing again. I think when you look at the industry and how you know everything starts to sound alike and people are longing to get something fresh, well that was the time the Commodores burst into the scene. And now I think that moment has arrived again. And here we are with an opportunity to make an innovative statement. At an age where many wind down, Thomas McClary is ready to ramp up, looking forward to new opportunities and a new direction. It's an amazing story of a truly unheralded legend of music. So what can we take away from him? How about the attitude he has of, why not me? Why can't I? He wasn't born some musical savant. He had no connections. All he had were dreams and the belief that he could make them come true. And this opportunity requires action. Very few people just fall into something great. When that chance comes, you have to recognize it and you have to be ready to jump on it. And finally, when things don't work out, as he says, choose love. He could be one of the most bitter guys around, but he's not. He's optimistic, he's passionate, and appreciative of what he does have. Thomas McClary, Mr. Commodore, is one inspiring guy. Hello. I'm Dr. Roger Landry, and I'm a preventive medicine physician focusing on successful aging. I'm also the author of Live Long, Die Short, a guide to authentic health and successful aging. You know all that stress that you're dealing with right now in your life? Seems like there's always stress. You know what? It's almost all self-induced. That's right. Unless there's a car bearing down on you that's going to hit you or there's a, a, a tiger chasing you, the stress that we feel is self-induced. Yes, we have life situations, but there's only three things we can do when we're faced with one of life's problems. We can either fix it or make a plan to fix it. And if we can't do that, we should walk away or accept it. All else is madness. And that stress that you generate in yourself as you, as you deal with these problems, it's like flooring the gas on a car and stepping on the brake, it's just ripping you up. It's a toxic environment. Don't let that happen. Find something that quiets your mind. A nature walk, reading a book, music, art, whatever. Find it. You need it. Break that stress. Thank you, Dr. Landry. You know, I've been a bit stressed lately by the near frantic search for a new word to describe aging, something that will make us feel better about growing older. This search has been going on for decades. Companies create focus groups looking for just the right word, and anti-ageism experts write extensively about promoting a new term that will magically change everyone's perception of growing older. Things like wisdom workers, grand elders, older adults, superagers, olders, perennials, golden agers, modern elders, third agers, boomers, and countless others. It's as if we believe that when we stumble upon the right descriptive word, we will immediately feel better about ourselves. The workplace will respect us and society will finally appreciate our value. This is exactly the problem. We allow these words to impact the way we think, what we believe, and how we age. We don't need new words. 
We need to change or expand the definition of current words. We do that by changing the way we live. And we change the way we live by changing our belief system about what's possible. Sure, words matter, but we can't allow ourselves to be bullied by them. We can't let someone calling us old or senior cause us to embrace the negative traits that are wrongly associated with those words. And we shouldn't be fooled into thinking that a new word will magically transform our later decades. The only thing that can do that is to start growing bolder. We'll see you next time. Support for Growing Bolder provided by More information about all of the stories you've seen here today is available at growingbolder.com slash TV. And you can get inspired to keep rebranding aging when you connect with the Growing Boulder community on Facebook. Growing Boulder Apparel is available for $25 plus shipping and handling. A companion book, Growing Boulder, Defy the Cult of Youth, Live with Passion and Purpose by Mark Middleton is available as well for $25 plus shipping and handling. And you can subscribe to Growing Boulder Magazine, four quarterly issues for $29.97 a year. Order online at growingbolder.com slash TV.